And this cuts two ways. Uh, one is a question of origins. While the French and Spanish roots of New Orleans are often referenced in popular and historical literature, African and indigenous, indigenous origins are rarely foregrounded with the attention they deserve. The other is a question of interracial reproduction and uncertainty that lies at sort of the root of New Orleans racial history. To a greater extent than almost anywhere else in the antebellum South, New Orleans' distinctive origins permitted a recognition of sexual practices, whether coercive or consensual, that made American race and racialism much less certain, but ironically made race much more decisive for the post-American, the post, excuse me, more decisive for the post-emancipation reconfiguration of citizenship. In other words, race became crucial to citizenship at that moment after, imagination, after emancipation. And this produced a particular politics of resistance to racial citizenship that has not really received its due. So I want to just say something brief about each of these. Um, and, and hopefully in doing so, I'll be able to show um, why the suppression of history through myth is so damaging, and also how the myths relied on by the Bush administration in its abandonment deflected from what we actually need to remember about New Orleans. So first, the crucial importance of its African origins. Um, historian Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's exceptionally detailed work on transports from Africa to Louisiana allows a very precise picture of Louisiana's African origins. Of the approximately 5,500 people who were transported to Louisiana from continental Africa, about 3,400 were Senegambian, the vast majority ethnic Mambara. This arrival pattern created, in Hall's terms, a united language group and by far the most cohesive corporate entity of all colonial inhabitants. Experience from earlier intracontinental migrations had already forged for the Bambara mechanisms for retaining cultural focus in spite of displacement. Um, <clears throat> the Bam Moreover, the Bambara conception of ethnic identity was based much more on practice than on geographic origin. Um, and what this enabled was uh, keeping group boundaries quite strong, but also permeable. Like the French, who are most frequently referenced for this, um, the Barbara frequently incorporated other groups to enhance their political position. Their prior experience of slavery also shaped their cultural interactions in the New World. Slaves in Cebu Bambara were not stripped of their status in the social order. Rather, slavery provided a route by which outsiders might gain an established place. With this cultural resiliency and an immense um, amount of technical and agricultural skills that I'm not going to go into, but Paul details, they were able to leverage their expertise to gain status much above the standard European deportee. Um, on the other hand, their expectation for advancement in colonial society based on these skills and expertise also led to frequent rebellions and alliances with indigenous people such as the Natchez. Um, the well-known Natchez Revolt in 1729 wiped out a large portion of the colony and its aim was clearly to displace the French rulers in favor of an allied um, Bambara Natchez uh, ruling class. Ironically, it also gave opportunity to those Mambara who did fight for the French to establish a colonial military presence. And that actually established a, a tradition that was retained up until the Civil War by um, free people of color. I know I'm going through this really fast, but we can talk about more questions. At the same time, it persuaded the French to expand and regularize the corporate status for both their indigenous allies and the Mambara. Um, in a bid to break the African Indian alliance and bind each group more closely to the French. Okay, so in short, Hall is arguing that the strength and cohesion of the African presence in Louisiana established a Franco African ethos that persisted well beyond the period of Americanization. And this distinctive pattern of racialization also produced a history of political resistance, and that's the second thing I want to talk about. Um, and in particular, resistance to the inscription of race within citizenship. From the inception of American control over, over New Orleans, free people of color guarded their distinctive civic status and retained the traditional rights and privileges really until the sectional tensions of the 1850s. While the older Francophone districts were 
enclaves of relative tolerance, the American newcomers were troubled by this triracial structure. Um, in 1916, well, and here again, I wanted to say myth does come into play. In 1916, in a special issue of The Crisis, the NAACP magazine, Jose Clarana recounts the history of this Creole mi middle group as this, those who fought a seemingly hopeless fight against every effort to curtail the liberties of people who cannot or do not want to be white. And let's pay attention to the language there. To fight against every effort to curtail the liberties of people who cannot or do not want to be white. Floranus makes the argument of many others that the Franco-African Creoles attached their political future to the recently freed people, that is, new citizens in the post-emancipation era, and engaged in a bid for citizenship that transcended the traditional obstacles of race and class. Um, however, until quite recently, this history was not so available to us, and in fact, the free people of color were uh, categorized in quite predictable collection of terms, and you see this recurring again and again. Exceptional, well-educated, French-speaking, highly status-conscious, I think Genovese uses the word haughty, wealthy, sometimes slave-holding, rigidly separatist, and largely conservative. So in short, another version of myth that gets perpetuated in the histories of this uh, very significant group and in some ways undermines their very important critique of uh, US citizenship. So recent scholarship has challenged this view quite a bit, and I'm just going to say a little bit about that and then wrap up. <laughs> okay. um, Karen Casabell has shown the existence of, a, of this radical tradition based on the Francophone politics, rights of man and the citizen, and the Enlightenment ideals of progress. Bell and Lawson describe at least two generations of political activism in the post-Civil War period. Um, and I was going to say a little about those, but I'm not going to go into them. But suffice it to say, their protests um, were central in doing things like desegregating the uh, New Orleans Star Cars, desegregating the public schools, um, almost with the inception of union occupation of New Orleans in 1862. These massive civil rights protests started, um, and they were um, rejuvenated in the late uh, 1880s by a group called the Citizens Committee that actually was the group that, that brought the Plessy case, uh, the very famous Plessy case, to the Supreme Court in a bid to roll back segregation. So even though that case is remembered as a case that was lost, the intention of the bid and the belief at the time was that it would actually stop um, segregation on public transport. Okay, so time prohibits tying all this together, but let me just make two quick points. The outrage following September 2005 did not save New Orleans and as of yet hasn't gained the political momentum to force government action on rebuilding for the people of the city. But it did represent a tear in that national myth, especially the myth that conjoined poverty and race in a pact of abandonment. And it also opened the possibility to reintroduce this history that otherwise has been drowned in myth. And that's why I think Jindal can't simply be lampooned. His assimilationist tale, his recasting of abandonment as exemplary self-sufficiency, his romance of individualism, his promotion of isolated local solutions, is a political position that flies in the face of his own regional history. New Orleans, New Orleans residents fought long and hard for citizenship. Citizenship, a role in government and decision making, not the right to do their own thing. They fought the myths of exceptionalism um, to make government by the people, by its citizens, accountable to them. Um, Art acknowledges that myth can't be displaced just by the facts, by exposure of the facts, but it can be challenged by a, po a political constituency um, aroused enough to see the threadbare uh, the character of these myths. And we seem to be in a moment when that's at least possible. Historical New Orleans, I want to argue, is worth revisiting, even as we demand that present day New Orleans be reclaimed for its people and, and actually for all our future.